Okay, there's a couple unique things about this video. The first is, this is the first time I've ever just pushed record on YouTube. I've never tried that before. So, I guess that means this is live like whatever I say. I can't go back and edit it. <laughs> Sometimes I edit things. The other unique thing is I'm going to the gym. And that's the first time I've gone to the gym in too long of a time. And part of it is because I kept seeing people that I know there who would encourage me to work out when I lost all my weight a few years ago and you know I haven't been going and so I had to say yeah I haven't been going they never give me a hard time but you know how it is and I've just got to go I'm tired all the time and part of the problem is I'm like super perfectionistic so I'm all or nothing and if I can't do it right I'm not going to do it at all well that's just kept me too long so anyway going back to the gym that's a good thing um okay well, I was just thinking that I have struggled with the issue of James versus Paul my whole Christian life. And I would say I have struggled with a good conscience over the matter. I started to develop a view of James kind of negative. And when I would encounter Christians and try to share my view, the reaction was so extreme that I thought I must be wrong. So I've done everything I can to try to reconcile over the years, like James and Paul, and you know, there's traditional interpretations, the most common one is that uh, James is speaking about justification by men, whereas Paul is speaking about justification before God. That's the traditional, you know, so I get that. Um, I, I doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't fit. And the other thing I, you know, thought was maybe, well, Philippians is talking about a present tense salvation where Paul says through the bountiful supply of the spirit, this will turn out to be for salvation that always, as always, even now with all boldness, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether through life or death. And he's speaking about shining as a luminary in this world as a kind of working out a present tense salvation to sh to testify before men and hold forth the word of life in this age and not just be consumed with his own troubles and his own issues but that Christ will be glorified that is a salvation so I thought maybe that is what James is talking about he's not talking about ultimate salvation but he's talking about present tense a salvation that's useful to others because you're helping the poor and you're not you're considering your brother and you're not making divisions in the church among the rich and the poor all that that's okay and yet I just why do I have to explain so convolutedly in order to fit James into the scheme of things you know it shouldn't be that difficult and you know I, you, you can see my view if you go to the prelude messages to Galatians. I did like three or four messages on James from the narrative of the book of Acts that puts him in context that shows that he is just not clear. The other interpretation that I've seen from dispensationalists, and I'm a dispensationalist, classical and hyper dispensationalists, and I'm not a hyper dispensationalist, is that the program for Israel has been a mix of works and grace and will go back to being works and grace during the tribulation. And that is just flat out contradicted by Paul, who tells us in Romans and Galatians that salvation has always been by faith, justification has always been by faith without works. And that imputed righteousness and justification are the same thing. He doesn't separate them. And uh, someone showed me a teaching of a brother who's very well respected. Um, and, you know, I haven't seen a lot of his teachings, but I know that people in, in who understand grace respect this teacher. Anyway, he's talking about, he's using James to say that Abraham was reckoned righteous when he believed in Genesis 15 that he would be the heir and that his seed would inherit the land you know what God promised 
and it, it says in Genesis fifteen six that he was it was reckoned to him for righteousness at that point. He believed God. But then he says, according to James, that he wasn't justified until Genesis twenty two during the offering of Isaac. So which was in his mind a you know, a work. So it's works and faith. And he says in the Old Testament, he uses a number of examples to show that imputation of righteousness and justification in the Old Testament were two different things and happened at different times and in the New Testament for believers we are reckoned righteous and justified at the same time and he uses James to support this because James talks about how Abraham was justified in Genesis 22 when uh, his faith was perfected in that great act. I have a respect for that kind of a nuanced view. I think that's like a brilliant way to try to look at it. However, it flatly contradicts Paul's statements in Romans and Galatians, where it is clear that to Paul, imputation of righteousness and justification are the same thing, and they happened for Abraham in Genesis 15, when he believed prior to circumcision, he was considered righteous before he was circumcised, and it's faith without works. That justification has always been faith apart from works. Or even, in David's case, him who works not. I mean, you know, when Paul's talking about David, he uses the words, he works not, but believes on him that uh, justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted to him as righteousness. There's no work that you can look at that makes this happen. And Paul says flatly, it is a contradiction to James. There's no way to get around the fact that James and Paul make open, blatant, bold statements that flatly, on the face, contradict each other. The only way you can synchronize them is to kind of massage and make these complicated explanations that then cast a light or a filter on all of your biblical theology. So you have to go back and change the whole program to accommodate James. Why are we bending over backwards because of one letter written prior to Acts 15 by a brother that we're not even 100% sure is actually an apostle who is clearly unclear. If you look at his statements in Acts 15 and in Acts 21, you can see that he does not understand the role that the Gentiles being saved has in God's program. He looks at that in the light of we're in the kingdom, Israel is being exalted, and now the Gentiles are coming to the light of Israel's rising. And everything he says is with the idea that we are still keeping Moses, we're not apostatizing from Moses, Moses is being preached in the synagogues, they'll hear it one way or another, I'll compromise in this matter, but, you know they're going to hear Moses one way or another. And eventually he ends up demanding that Paul go into the temple and take a vow to show the multitudes who believe in Jesus but are zealous for the law that he's not apostatized from Moses. Why would he do that if he was in any way clear about Paul's gospel? John and Peter both were helped by Paul. Peter kind of trail behind but Paul, John built everything he said kind of in his gospel at least on like, like Ephesians truths I mean it is all mystery of Christ it's all Pauline 
and you know Paul, John went to Ephesus to help bring people back to the simplicity in Christ after all the doctrinal battles that went on after he wrote Revelation and so he was saturated in that stuff you know in, in Pauline high peak Ephesians kind of truth James doesn't seem to get it and it is from James that really most of Christianity gets its understanding of justification which is a mix of faith and works now the dispensationalists who say you know James was talking about Old Testament justification it's a mix of faith and works are at least correct in trying to keep that stuff out of the church but they still have they still find themselves having to justify James and tweaking their theology for Israel in a way that then there's no grace in the tribulation and it's this different rule justification and I said this in a message recently yesterday I guess justification has been the same all along it's always been imputed righteousness by faith in God's promise but the only difference is depending on what group you're a part of based on the timing of your salvation you will have a different allotted inheritance if you're in Israel you have one kind of inheritance which is earthly and if you're in the church you have a heavenly inheritance so there's a, there are different allotments which definitely affects the outcome and the direction you're going in but grace has always been grace faith has always been faith and even though Israel did receive the law, the law, which was added 400 years after the promise, couldn't disannul the promise. Disobedience to the law and law breaking couldn't disannul the fact that they were heirs if they believed in the promise. It was faith in the promise. Whether they were law keepers or law breakers, and they were all law breakers, didn't matter. The law was added for transgressions so that they could see and we could all see what kind of sinners we really are based on what God's requirement so that we can understand how good the grace of God is so faith has never been accompanied with works for justification and it's flat wrong to say that it ever has or ever will be there is not a different kind of uh, requirement you see, and then the other thing is we take the tribulation parables, right? Uh, Matthew 25. We just have to remember those are parables. The parable of the ten virgins and the others that seem to, you know, we cannot drive doctrine out of those parables. We have to let doctrine speak for itself and then say, well, then I don't fully understand the parable. That's okay. It's okay to not understand the parable. I keep saying this. I keep going back to this point, but... It's really, I'm just seeing, wow, I have never seen anything good in my 25 years of seeking as a Christian who has tried to keep a good conscience. That doesn't mean I've lived a sinless life or anything like that. I've gone into all kinds of messes, but it's always been based on a struggle of trying to be honest in my conscience. Uh, I've not seen any good fruit come theologically from trying to accommodate James. I've never seen any good fruit come out of it. Never. So, I'm not saying James is a false brother or anything like that. I believe that the Holy Spirit put his letter in there so that we could have a heads up of what we're dealing with. That there was a situation in Jerusalem that looked so godly but was so wrong that ended up being the source of trouble for the church for the next 2,000 years. Because almost every bad theology I've seen is spun out of James. Either by denying Paul's ministry or trying to synchronize the two of them. And it is amazing how much weight we have given James. And I can see why Luther didn't even want it in the canon. And I wouldn't go that far. We need to know this history. 
So this is really dramatic and radical. I know that I nobody. I don't know anybody who's saying what I'm saying right now. Oh, there, are, I, there probably are. I just haven't really heard much. And I know that, and that's why I keep, I've held off on it and I've tried to retract and go back and at points in my Christian life and go back to, okay, no, I can receive James. I can, I can figure this out. You know, I, I'm done. I, I, I just feel like I'm tired of the fight of trying to make this work for James. I think the Acts narrative pretty much tells the story. And if we just believe it, for what it is, we will see that James wasn't clear, and, and that a, that epistle that he wrote, which was prior to the Acts 15 con, con, conference, so there's no way he would have really understood Pauline truth at that point, because Paul hadn't gone up to Jerusalem to explain it. He went to Jerusalem by revelation to explain the gospel he preached, and Paul's ministry and his gospel has a unique set of contents that shines a light on the whole Bible and has to be the lens through which we interpret everything that went before. And all legalism and mixture comes in from failure that I've seen to appreciate the uniqueness of Paul's role. It can't be overstressed how Paul, how much light Paul was given and whether you accept or embrace him, and to the degree that you recognize the distinctive of his ministry, will determine how well you grow in grace and in your understanding of the Bible. Okay, I'm almost at the gym. I'll talk to you later.